Millennium 2.2 is an easy access space sim. It's Amigos, episode 322. <laughs> Hi everybody, welcome to Amigos. I'm John. And I'm Aaron. And today, Aaron, we're going to be talking about Millennium 2.2. Oh yeah. Aaron, do you remember what you did at the turn of the Millennium? I do. I do remember what I did. It was so lame. I remember, you know, when you're when it's 1989 or 90, and the Millennium's coming, but still 10 years away, you got plenty of time. And I remember talking to my friends, we're going to go out and sit on this island and sit in front of a lighthouse or go up on a mountain. And we're mm -hmm. going to, all of our close friends are going to get together. And mm -hmm. it was going to be this big thing, right? And ultimately, I believe I was up, gosh, 2000. I was in, I think I was, I was still in Lexington. And I think I had a party that was no good. And I don't remember anything that happened. I don't, I don't, I don't mean that in a good way. I mean, it was completely nondescript, and mm -hmm. nothing happened. And, and on top of that, with the year 2K thing was going on, I had made certain predictions that oh. did not come true. So I was also— Well, you can't leave us hanging, man. What were these predictions? Well, you know, a lot of people were going bananas about the Y2K bug. Right, and there, right. I, I know when no one believes this, but I swear to you, there was something to it to a certain degree. Sure. It yeah. could have been a problem, okay? Mm -hmm. Did I think— uh, the world would explode, no. But I thought there was a distinct possibility that things like the internet could have be affected or, uh, uh, you know, network issues and yeah. whatnot. And have, because having been in that field, I used to see stuff all the time that didn't work, wasn't Y2K compatible. And so I certainly, I made certain predictions that I thought there would be difficulties and issues that, and none of that came to pass. So, there you go. So I, I was the I was the tin foil hat guy that night. Well, what you tell people is that oh, it's a good thing I saved the internet. They know you make it. You mode. just you spin it back to yourself and say, "Listen, I took care of some things, and we're, everything's cool." Well, they didn't realize that I, twenty years later, instead of one massive destruction of the internet, I'm slowly ruining it a little at a time. But <laughs> one hour at a time. What about you? What were you doing that fateful eve? So I always thought. That the, if the world was going to end in the year two, you know, January first, uh, two thousand, at least I would a be an adult. I'd be eighteen because I turned eighteen in July of nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, and b get at least one semester of college in. Yeah, and so I did. I did both of those things, and uh, I on the the January thirty first, I went over to my friend uh, Josh's house. And uh, a bunch of other band kids were there, and we got extremely, extremely inebriated. There you and, go. Well, uh, that's that's pretty good, though. I mean, yeah, that's it was pretty I good. Got. I mean, I, I still remember what I, I I was wearing one of these suns out, guns out tanks. You ever wear the tank top around at parties? I'm not a big tank tank top guy. Really? Yeah. When when I when huh. I did that 10k and I'd lost all that weight, I would every once mm -hmm. in a while I would I would, I would sport the tank. Because I was working and out this and stuff, is, but not, not so this much. This was at the heyday when I looked most like the lead singer from Bare Naked Ladies. Isn't he and a so, world-class uh, geek? Yes. Okay. Well, I mean, look at who you're talking to. And uh, and yeah, it was uh, that was that was the year. The year 2000. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, were you let down that there wasn't a... Did you think there might be a calamitous out, like outcome? Uh, No. No, because I mean, think about it. you. Just all you have to do is look back over the course of the ages of how many times the world has been predicted to end, and we're still we're still hanging out, man. We're still doing our thing. We're like cockroaches, the giant yeah. kind. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was happy it didn't explode or anything, but I don't know. Part of me, part of me yearned for a Mad Max world mode. I think I would thrive in that environment. I have no doubt you nice would thrive. And warm. You've already got the outfits picked yeah, out out in the desert. I could mm -hmm. get one of those glue one mohawks. You know, I got weapons over here too, and most mm -hmm. of my cars look like they've been from a Mad Max world, <laughs> so it would have worked that good. That's very true. You could have worked that cigarette lighter as heater angle for a long time. <laughs> I would have been the king of heaters. I'd be the only guy that had one. That would be awesome. <laughs> well, Aaron, why don't we uh, see what's been going on in the world of Amiga news this week? Why don't we? News. All right, Aaron. All right, Aaron. So the first thing we've got here is 
you know, Huselbeck, this guy is the man when it comes to repackaging and reselling his glory years of compositions. Uh, Turrican has been remixed, remastered, and re-put out on nearly every available media format in every conceivable combination of instruments. And he's doing it again, Aaron. This is actually not um, Chris Huselbeck's work. This comes to us from another guy. He has taken the um, the themes from Turrican, and this is a guy, his name is Cordian Wycheck, mm. okay? And he has rearranged the themes from Turrican into an album he calls Dueling Pianos, because this is uh, two pianos uh, playing the themes from Turrican. So uh, if that oh. interests you, you can check this out on Chris Huselbeck's Bandcamp page, chrishuselbeck.bandcamp.com. And uh, you can purchase, you can listen to this album now, uh, or you can purchase it for the low, low price of $9 US, Aaron. Did you see this here? Buy the digital dis discography, right? Which is mm -hmm. like a ton of stuff. Two, 48 releases Huselbeck has done. 200 wigwams, boat, the big money. <laughs> Yeah, that's a lot of wad, isn't it? I mean, I mean, that's, I know there's some big tunes there, but I mean, two hundred bucks. What's the, there must be an it's, angle it's, there. It's for people who want it all, you know. And and a lot of these too, I think, you know, you're talking about forty eight albums at ten bucks an album. I mean, you're getting a deal. Is that what we're you, talking that, about? That's four hundred eighty dollars if you four, pay ten these bucks are all an album. Albums. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's yeah. I guess that's good. I don't know. That's yeah. amazing. That's a lot of albums of music. It is, it is. And it looks like Uselbeck has uh, composed a lot of royalty-free stuff. So this could be your chance if you're looking for some uh, some Uselbeck-inspired tunes for your podcast or your video series or whatever. Uh, you can check that out, too. So. Hmm. Yeah, I have to look into that myself. Neat. You know, I'm, I'm a big royalty-free guy, so all my albums are royalty-free. Yeah, take off, eh? <laughs> all right, Aaron, coming up next on the news train... We've got another arcade port that's coming to the Amiga. This time, it's Ms. Pac-Man. Oh, yeah. So, uh, it wasn't that long ago that JOTD released uh, Pac-Man. Uh, now, he's gone and done it again. He's moved on to the sequel, which is, by all accounts... Uh, is Have you ever met anybody that's preferred the original Pac-Man to Ms. Pac-Man? Oh, Lord, no. No, no. 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 Uh, I love... You know, we owned a Ms. Pac-Man back, mm -hmm. back in the day. When I say we, I mean me. Brent wasn't involved, but I did own one of these. What a deal I got, Boat, by the way, on this on this back. I got a Donkey Kong and a Miss Pac-Man and something else. I got it for, oh, Road Blasters. Got them dirt cheap, brother. They were giving That's them great. away. Uh, but then I had to sell everything because I got fired while I got laid off. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, Miss Pac-Man, great game, great looking cabinet. Me and Brent were talking about when we did female protagonists. This is one of the early lady protagonist in all video games, the Mrs. Pack. The story behind this game is always entertaining. I think it was the General Electronics that were basically making a bootleg board for Pac-Man, and when they got together mm -hmm. with the people there and said, let's make a deal. Good move, by the way, because this was a big money yeah. maker. And also, you say, this is one of those games. There are a few games from like the early 80s, and you say, they linger, right? And in fact, I would say there are two that come to mind. And this is one, and the other one is, of course, Galaga. You see, yeah. those are ones you'll occasionally still see out in the. They're in they're the so thing. popular that Namco actually released a two in one cabinet just a few years ago called the Class of 1981, uh, that features both these games in the same cabinet. So yeah, both of these games, Stone Cold Class. The problem with that is it's got a it's got a pay to continue feature, which I find yeah, that's no good. No I good. Hate that. Yeah, that's no good. I yeah. think you can turn it off though. But yeah, this looks great, by the way. Yeah, they've uh, they've they've done the right thing and made the the screen the right aspect ratio yeah. and like some. Some, you know, Pac-Man transcodes I could name. That's, that's uh, the way you do Everything it. is on the screen at one time. It's a real port, Aaron. This isn't somebody messing around. Look, even the little peach is bebopping around, Boat. I like yeah, it. Yeah. Good, good I job. I like it a lot. Good job. Yeah, I can't wait to see that. That'll be great. Now, check this out, Aaron. All this right. is not something that I expected to see over at Indie Retro News this week. All right. You don't see too many Wheel of Fortune games appearing on the Amiga this week. All right, yeah, ever. Well, or this week. <laughs> This is only yeah. the third one. Now, this is a game called Yawafa, and this is a word puzzle game that plays like Wheel of Fortune. You spin the wheel, you get points, you solve the puzzle. Uh, did you play Wheel of Fortune on any any of your game oh, systems back God. in the day? Oh, my God. I played the... Keep in mind, I was in uh, uh, ninth grade, 
<laughs> we had the old IBM CGA specials up in the old computer lab at the high school. And this game and Jeopardy were two games that were always around. And we played the crap out of these games. I've played a million games of this. I've played a million games. And now on the old version, much like Jeopardy, spelling counts. So yeah. when you tried to solve the puzzle, you could look like... It was a little bit easier on this, but not always. And you look like a big mm-hmm. doofus. But, man, I played the crap out of this. I can still remember digitized, blocky Vanna White scrolling... Mm-hmm. Uh, along that green background to turn those letters, you know, in the thing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we played the crap. I played out of a this. ton of Wheel of Fortune on the old CGA PC and Jeopardy. Uh, but I also had a clone on the um, on the Atari computer. I think it came with an, an issue of an Antic magazine called "Words Are Fun." <laughs> so that was that was a lot an of intriguing fun to play. title and also yeah. wrong. Yeah. Words are fun. <laughs> <laughs> Spelling words isn't fun anyway. This looks, well, I mean, this looks uh, like Wheel of Fortune. I don't have yeah. a problem with it. I'm down. Yeah, we may have to fire this up on the next that, Amiga. That could be. That could be the next. Segment. That could be the game of the week someday in the future. <laughs> hey, I would play some Wheel of Fortune all day long. I wouldn't have a problem. Me too. With it. Me too, man. All right, Aaron. Our next story is all about the Amiga One X five thousand. You know, we don't talk a lot about the next gen Amigas. We're scared because of we them. don't really know yeah. a lot they about the next gen Amigas. However, there's this guy called TJ Ferreria. Okay. Yeah. And uh he is uh he is an expert in the X five thousand. He's got one sitting there right behind him. And in this video he's changed his mind. Now I'm not gonna give away the plot and tell you what he says. But I'm just going to say, listen, if you are wondering about the current state of the NG Amiga project and you'd like to see this guy's thoughts on it, look at this guy. He looks like he knows what he's talking about because, first of all, he's got a nice full beard and he's sitting in one of those wacky gamer chairs with the headrest. He looks like so, if he looks like if Einstein and Uncle Jesse from the Dukes of Hazard had a son, it'd be this guy. <laughs> he looks he looks wise. I, 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 this is You're not going to give me any is, hint as to what he's talking about here? No, no. He's not I'm, putting I'm, I'm over not the five. Away. Okay. But I will say that uh, this guy has some really interesting videos, including uh, ones about the Intellivision Amico. So this this guy undoubtedly has some opinions about things. So if you want to check it out, head over to TJ Ferreria's uh, site. And, of course, we have updated the link here on the news page. Bitly slash Amiga News will take you exactly where you need to go. I apologize for the past couple of weeks where we've had a link that did not in fact work and thank you to pixels at dawn for pointing that out to me uh so now bitly slash amiga news takes you where you need to go you know tj ferreria here i'm looking over i'm just looking at the stats here and there's always he's got 78 thumbs up and there's always that one geek that mm-hmm. rolls around that he's a he's the he's like the universal hater he's gonna hate everything and i don't yeah. i so having not known what this guy says he must not have been too controversial because we know in the in this community you can it's you can easily get more than one perennial hater to come around. So he must have been, <laughs> his opinion must be very popular. Otherwise he would have getting he'd get murdered. So that sounds good. Thank you. But well done, Boat. All right. And finally, Aaron, this is a new video from our buddy Chris Edwards and more of his adventures with the terrible fire card. So tell us about this, Aaron. Well, this was this was another one that we're, we're Chris goes to work, and first of all, he goes. And this was interesting to me. This part here, where he fixes the keyboard on his five, on his five or his twelve was this a five hundred? I didn't realize that you could just go get a new gimmick to put those. A new you know membrane, that? right? Now you did that for the Atari, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I did that with the Atari. But you're right; I had not heard of people making those did for you, other computers. Yours, Maybe that's a thing you can get. Did yours look like this? Is one of the reasons I want to talk about this. Did yours look like that with the kind of the, just kind of yeah. stiff plastic? How like it, floppy it looked, was it? Was it? You know what it I'm was saying? very floppy. It oh, was very floppy. And, and I totally uh, did not succeed in installing it correctly. Yeah. Uh, and oh, so what I happened? ended up. Uh, well, I I I have no skill with electronics repair. That's what happened. <laughs> Um, and so uh, no, I ended up shipping it. the computer and the membrane to a guy in California, sight unseen from Atari age. He's just like, yeah, I do those. And I was like, all right, here's my computer from when I was a kid. And uh, But yeah, uh, true to form, he fixed it for me, sent it back, and I haven't had a, a problem with it since. Yeah, and then the rest of the video is Chris trying to correctly configure uh, the uh, the drive port on the terrible fire to do what he wants. Well, uh, it's hard. This stuff's all hard. 
Chris well, is a, I, Chris is an well, expert. When you say that the drive port, well, yeah, I don't it's understand got like what a, that means. It's got a it's got a hard drive port on the on the actual Terrible Fire card you can use. Oh, okay. Right? Uh, among other things, and it was uh, it's hard, you know. And he he uh, he tried every angle. Uh, he's a patient dude. And uh, it was uh, it was difficult, and that's that's the show. So, but I mean, I kind of, <laughs> I'm a sick man. So because I've struggled so long with so many hard things, that it that I don't mind seeing someone else struggle to see if they can figure it out or what the ultimate goal was. I don't want to spoil the surprise, but it was entertaining uh, and wacky. So if you're into that sort of thing, if you, you know what. Chris now, does said, this does this inspire you at all, Aaron, to get your own terrible fire card? This for your inspires me to sell all my Amigas, and 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 and, <laughs> and then buy seven more Misters. That's what this inspires me to do. This is <laughs> this makes me nervous. That's why it's, I can get my fix of this sort of thing without actually being the guy suffering through it. Because you've mm-hmm. seen some of my sketchy take videos. When I'm trying to do stuff on the on the on the Amiga or the Coco, remember that Coco keyboard project that I, I had oh, to yeah. the, hook the, up the with the manufacturer pie. and all that stuff, you know. And, and let's not the less said about the un Amiga, the better. But like, <laughs> I mean, I can fill 20 videos with these things, and it just drives me nuts. And so I uh, uh, I would rather just relax with a cold one and just watch someone else do it, especially Chris, yeah. uh, my kind of wacky tech. So another wacky Chris video, give it a shot. There you go, Boaster. All right, Aaron. Uh, before we leave our news segment, we should probably check out what's been going on over at Retro Rewind's site this week. Bam. Retro Rewind. Well, Frank's been at it again, actually. I'm going to I'm gonna hop over there real quick. The uh, okay, man. Frank ha- has just... he's. We mentioned this last week briefly. He's in the process of putting together a, uh, uh, a bench power supply... Uh, for uh, all the Commodore machines, the C64, the Amiga, uh, those machines. He's also, he just put up something on Twitter, uh, which I haven't got to even look at it yet, but he sent it out. I saw it come off of his of his webpage. He's always got some kind of thing. Going. I think it's a custom ROM, if I'm not mistaken. Hmm. Did you see that pop up on Twitter? No, I haven't. I haven't yeah. seen that. So, But, I mean, listen, if you need if you need some sweet action, on your Commodore related computer. There's and you're in North America in particular. There's only one place to go. And that's our boy, Frank, at RetroRewind.ca. Not only does he have parts, replacement parts, ROMs, the OSs, the whole nine yards, he also sells cap kits and he will do your recap himself. Uh, you can send it up there and some and the fine folks at Retro Rewind will recap your C sixty four, your one twenty eight your Amiga family of computers, even the CD32 boat, can get a recapping at r- ridiculous, ludicrous prices, low, double low prices, uh, and quick too. It's a it's a good safe bet if you send your reworks up to Frank. Listen, we just talked about Chris Edwards. He was struggling. This stuff's hard. If you want to mm-hmm. get in here and risk having a bad day, I can tell you this firsthand. Go in there and think to yourself, you know, I'm going to recap some crap today. I recapped an arcade <laughs> monitor, my Donkey Kong, and mm-hmm. then I thought, this won't be hard. I'm a, I'm a pro, brother. I can't possibly screw up. And it never worked. And I, finally, my I, my dad was looking at my monitor. He goes, what's wrong with this? I was like, I screwed it up. He goes, you need solder right here. I was like, that ain't it. He took the solder and I went, ting, and then it came to life. It looked great. But that's all it takes. One screw up and you're done. You know Frank's mm-hmm. not going to screw up. He's a pro. He's got professional yeah. machines up there to take care of business. He's the man to call, Boat. Yeah, and for whatever you want to buy from Frank, you can save 10% off your order by using the promo code AMIGOS10 at checkout. We appreciate and we love Retro Rewind, and we thank them for being a supporter of Amigos. Mm-hmm. All right, Aaron, it's time to talk Millennium 2.2. Oh, Has man. there ever been a worse name for a game than Millennium 2.2? Yes, uh, there has actually that the that, uh, ZX Spectrum game about the worm comes to oh, mind. Fat boy blows a spark. That's, that's the one. <laughs> See, I didn't have to even say the name, and you knew what it was. Let's talk about this thing, boat. Millennium two point two, just like Rush boat, uh, released in eighty nine. Now I'm not going to ask if you've played this because I know there's a zero percent chance you played this. There's a less than 0% chance I would have played this. I want to stop right here. If you're watching at home here, we're on the Millennium 2.2 uh, 
intro screen. It says Millennium 2.2, and there's a triangle, and it has a uh, couple letters under it. Now, look at that. What's Ed. that look like to you, Boat? Ed, like no, Mr. Ed. Right, and why is that? Because this was made, this was, pre, uh, uh, this thing was published by Electric Dreams. Now, mm -hmm. I looked at this, I, I looked at this when it came up, and I was like, wait a minute. That looks just like the Captain EO logo. Hmm. Okay. So I didn't I, make that connection. Oh, I did, because I saw Captain EO in the theater boat back at Disney World. It was out when I was there with the band. And mm -hmm. so, this is a sidebar, but I'm going to say it anyway. So, we go up. So, I'm looking this up, and I'm like, you know, maybe I'm nuts. I'm going to Google. I'm going to wiki, get the Captain EO wiki. And at the very bottom of the wiki, it says, the Captain EO logo looks very similar to the Electric <laughs> Dreams logo. I was like, yes! <laughs> so, I'm not the only one that thought Affirmation, that. Affirmation, baby. But there it is. <laughs> That's so if you if you ever looked at that and wonder what was going on, that's what's going on. <laughs> that's exactly what's happening. They just and the thing is, they Electric Dreams had it first, clearly. So, because I don't know when Captain EO came up, but I think it was well, listen, later than this. Nobody's gonna the Electric Dreams folks didn't have the jack to sue MJ, so he probably was playing this game. You it know, he was a big gamer. It would have had and to have I been close like, because I was in yeah. the band in '89, and this came out in '89. So mm -hmm. it's I, who knows who ripped off who. You know, that's true. That's a stupid thing to say. I'm sure this ripped off Captain. <laughs> Let's play Spike's boat. So anyway, this came out in '89. Uh, I, we mentioned published by Electric Dreams boat. Cool name. We always liked that mm -hmm. one. Uh, developed by the lamest sounding, <laughs> the lamest development company of all time, Software Studios. That's. The, no good. Yeah. No good. They didn't do they now. He, no, so hear me out on this because this is sort of incorrect. All right. <clears throat> I looked into these software studios, guys. Okay. Software studios were Activision's UK in house development slash support team. This comes off the Moby webpage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, they were established in an old elect Electric Dreams office in Southampton, UK, mm -hmm. right, in the 80s. And they did technical and creative development for Activision. Okay, now they were responsible for some some titles we've looked at actually. One title that, if you'll recall, was one of the finest titles we ever played on the Amiga, Altered Beast. Oh and yeah, it, that was yeah. <laughs> the <laughs> source of my never-ending humiliation. Boot. Um, they did Atomic Robo Kid, Galaxy Force One and Two, IK Plus, Power Drift, SDI. None of these have anything to do with this game, and the reason is. Yeah. This game was really done by, like, one person with some help from two others, okay? Uh, the artist, or the coder and uh, general designer of this game is a fellow named Ian Bell. Or, excuse me, Bird. Bird. I was going to say, Ian Bell, isn't that the guy that did Elite? <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know. Maybe. This is I Ian Bird. Is. Or no, it's David Bell or something like that. Now, anyway. this is one of only two games of the Amiga. The other game is the sequel to this, which we'll talk about later on. The graphics for this were made by J. Redman. J is spelled cool guy style. J A I. So I think that's it's still J, right? J A I. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the music. Now you may have heard of this guy, Boatster. He's a man I like to call the Whitster, David yeah. Whitaker. He's done it all. E Just to go over a couple of his uh, contributions: Bubble Bobble, uh, first person pinball, which was probably the height of his career. Uh, Golden Axe, <laughs> Fright Night. Got to. Gotta get that in there. He, you talk about up and down uh, on the on the games. He went for well. Let's, I mean, I, I, David Whitaker did not compose the Bubble Bobble theme. I know. He, he rearranged. It <laughs> I'm for just me. saying. He, this guy, he, he, they had him work on every conceivable game. Listen, he probably worked a couple hours a day. He knocked out some tunes, and then people would just line up and be like, "Hey, can I have a song?" And he'd be like, "Here you go." It's like, listen. We're desperate for a hot theme for first-person pinball, Dave. Right. He's like, bam, I got it. I got you. Uh, he also uh, worked on Star Wars music and the music to Xenon 2 Mega Blast. Um, although, when you think of Xenon 2 Mega Blast, you think of that cool song, Bomb the Bass song. Mm -hmm. um, this was an OCS offering boat, so it's right up your alley. There was not an AGA. It had not even been uh, pondered at this point. Now, it's funny. All the Amiga sites say this came out for the Amiga and the ST, but it also came out for DOS. I don't know why they don't mention right. that. In fact, aside from the fact that I saw it listed in like Moby and a couple other places, it's also in the book. <laughs> it's on the manual. It says, here's the mm -hmm. DOS instructions for loading this Maybe thing. Maybe it's just DOS is implied. DOS has another name. 
All right. Here's the name for the yeah. DOS one because you didn't like 2.2, but this one's called Millennium Return to Earth. That's a better name. Is that <laughs> what was that? Well, at first I said back to Earth. But no, no, Return, Return to Earth. Earth. Back's not cool enough sounding. Okay, what are you going? Okay, you, you're the marketing director. Yeah. Which do you choose, Millennium Return Two Point Two? Yeah, yeah. Because that actually explains what you're doing in the game. Well, also I thought Millennium Two Point Two was uh, like a version upgrade from Millennium One, and, right? And it's not. So there you go. Horrible name. Well, it, the game takes place in two thousand two hundred. I guess that's where they get it. But you know? yeah. So there you yeah. go. Um. So. Let's get into this game, Boat, proper, okay? So, the game, and I'm going to summarize the epic, epic uh, flavor text in the book, okay? So, you're, here you are on Earth. It's t it's the year 2180 or whatever, okay? And we have sent colonies in the space, two colonies. We've got one on the moon, because, of course, the moon. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to mine that cheese. And then you also yep. sent some suckers. I feel sorry for these suckers. They went to Mars, okay? So, who to thunk it? Asteroid come, whacks the Earth, kills everybody. Blow I mean, The Earth is still there. It's sort of like a Thundar-type gimmick, you know? Mm -hmm. Runaway right. planet hurtling between the Earth and Moon. Except this that was 97, right? Thundar? No, it was way before that. Thundar? No, no, I mean, the, oh, in, in mean, the year yeah. 1997, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Man, good, good memory, Boat. Thank you. So, anyway... Uh, this time, a runaway asteroid hurtled into the Earth and killed everybody on it. And so the only people left are the people on Mars and the people on the moon. And you play one of the moon guys, all right? And you're running the moon base. Now, you don't get too far into the game before you hear from the people on Mars. And, of course, the people on Mars are jerks. They're like, yeah, we're, like, we're take, we claim the Earth, and so we're going to kill you if you try to send probes out or do anything. We're going to we're mm -hmm. gonna consider an act of war. Mm -hmm. The book leads you to believe that the people on Mars, aside from the fact that they're mean, oh, by the way, they're kind of mutated. That'll right. happen on the Red Planet boat. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, what's to do? Well, it's your job as the King Dong of the Moon to get your production and whatnot up to snuff to where you can send out people to colonize uh, to extend Earth's reach all over the place. Plus, you're trying to get enough jack together to hopefully take your people back down and reclaim the Earth it's, to some capacity because word on the street from your probes and stuff is that Earth, all the destruction and stuff is slowly subsiding. And mm -hmm. so hopefully you can get your people back there. But you, thought, you can't just throw some guys a rocket and launch off. You don't got a rocket. You don't got guys. You don't got nothing. You got like 100 people. And the game is about getting together... Uh, all the uh, production and, and research and whatnot you need to make these goals obtainable. Uh, did that sound about right to you, Bode? That sounds good, man. Now, before we go any further, I did watch Kim Justice did a piece on this. Mm -hmm. And she said that this game was very, the, the plot of this game was very similar to a TV show called Space 1999. I've never seen that show. Have you watched any Space 1999? I have. I have. I didn't like it. <laughs> I know mm -hmm. Martin Landau was in it. Uh, and I like him. It's is not he related a show... to John Landau Murphy? You know who Martin Landau is? Come on. No. You ever seen Ed Wood? Yep. Okay, he played Bela Lugosi in that. Okay. But he's been, he's been around forever. He's been in everything. Um, So, as I recall... <clears throat> now, I haven't seen Space 1999 for a while, but I believe the Earth was like... It seems like there was a nuclear incident on the on the Earth that okay. caused them to leave in that. It was a different sort of life ending thing, but it yeah. was the Earth has been destroyed in that. Yeah, show and too. I believe, of course, it happened in 1999. Uh, so it's funny how all these TV shows predicted we'd be screwed well before now. We showed them. <laughs> we we have not yet begun we to defile our plan. Years to get screwed. Yeah, but, but honestly, I don't. There's I don't remember enough about that show to make any sort. Of, I mean, I guess the text sort of looks the same. The moon base. Sort of looks like that, uh, okay. but I don't. I don't know. Um, what did you think about this? Just coming up, you know, you read the flavor text, you saw the manual. What's your What were your first thoughts on this thing, Boaster? Well, whenever we get a game like this, especially because it was it was chosen by old Level Lord, okay, and Level Lord is a fan of the strategy game. He's a, a Amigos game selection committee member, Level Lord, and I know that whatever he picks, we're always in for a treat. And by a treat, I mean time to break out the manual that's yeah. what i mean yeah which so <laughs> yes exactly which exactly that's exactly what i did too 
<laughs> so um, I was pleasantly surprised to see that the manual was only, you know, six pages long. And uh, and <laughs> the majority of that was the story of what happened before the, the you know what what put us into this this situation. I mean, I mean, so, let me just um, interrupt you for a split second here. I printed the manual out sight unseen. I didn't even look at this sucker. I was like, I know I'm in for it because I know they're. Gonna, I was scared. You know me when it comes mm -hmm. to these games. Oh yeah. So I walked back to the printer. I'm like, oh man, there's like 20, 25 pages here. And I look. I'm like, Le Moon? What the heck is this? And there's, of course, it's a, it's a multilingual manual. Right. And you're right. There were six pages. I, I dropped to my knees. I was like, thank you. Thank you, sweet Lord. Because I was mm -hmm. worried to death. And a lot of it, like you said, is flavor tech. You're dead on. Yeah. Now, when you first get into the game, uh, I was shocked, stunned, and amazed. Because, Aaron, this is a game that has tooltips. This is a game when you hover over an icon on the screen instead of making you cross-reference the manual that's printed in 16,000 languages, you see the word that the icon represents on the screen presented in English text in 1989. Yeah. The the fact that this guy only made one game is quite possibly two. the biggest tragedy, two games, is quite possibly the biggest tragedy in Amiga's history because he cracked the code. He cracked the code that says, listen, you don't need to have the manual ready at all times. You can put all the information you need on the screen so you can do something I like to call having fun playing the game. <laughs> wow. Okay. Oh, burial. This is great. The UI in this was fantastic. I went through every single one of the systems and I understood what it did. There's a zoom out. There's a zoom in. You zoom in on your moon base. You zoom in on your colony. Everything makes sense except for one thing. You're going to spend 90% of your time on this game on the same screen, and that is your moon base screen. Okay? The moon base screen shows your moon base, which looks like uh, it's got a central hub and it's got spokes and it's got nodules that are sticking out of it. There's like where six or seven here. nodules. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Underneath that, you've got buttons, and the buttons say defense, resources, um, uh, help me out here. What else is on there? There's uh, research, life support, production, research, uh, right. defense. Okay. So I'm like, awesome. Here are some buttons for me to click on, just like all the other buttons in this <laughs> no. game. So you're clicking, nothing. Yes. You're clicking some more, nothing. Yes. You're like, well, maybe I need to click on one of these other buttons and then click on this again. Nothing. No, no. I spent 10 or 15 minutes and I read through the manual. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. what is going on? Why can I not do anything on this game? Yeah. And I was getting mad. I was getting real mad because up until this point, I was having a good time. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Here's the, here, it, for, for whatever reason, they put those buttons on the screen, but you cannot interact with them at all. Yeah. They show you the status of whatever is going on. For example, like uh, you're, if, you know, if everything's good, it's green. If you've got stuff that needs to be done, it's yellow. If stuff is bad, it's red. Those, those colors change. The buttons change colors. But to actually interact with the different parts of the moon base, you have to click on the correct nodule. I would that call is those the status only... bars is what I would call because yeah, the that is buttons the on... make you think you can yeah. click them. Yeah, yeah, that mm. is the only thing that's wrong with the UI of this game. Everything else is great. And to me, that is what makes or breaks a game like this is how much am I going to fight against the system that's trying to make me do what I'd like to do. So my first impression of this game amazing because i could understand the systems the icons made sense there were tool tips that prevented me from having to look at the manual it was fantastic first of all yes everything you just said about those toolbars or those 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 uh uh buttons as you call it at the bottom of the screen that is the height of stupidity not having those be clickable because mm -hmm. you're clicking around that moon base and that stuff's not labeled i mean you're clicking so quick you know it says it at the top but you it doesn't say it when you're on you know it's you've got the button at the bottom why would you not let right. you use that that doesn't make any sense right. now i don't know if they're i don't know what the i don't know i don't know what's going on there so you have to get used to using that moon base as a button various but yeah and you do get used it, to it once you once you're in there it's fine but it just it, it was a missed opportunity. And how sure. long did it take you to figure out there was a hanger on this <laughs> right in the right. middle? Yeah, I was right. like that it that was the last thing I found. There's a lot of that. Like when you go to the when you go to various like we're right now we're looking at the uh, place where you produce stuff. <clears throat> and so 
the, you on that, there's you have to figure out where to click. Like you click on this sc- little TV screen. There's yeah. a lot of that but crap. But again, <clears throat> but again, once you realize that you're meant to click on things on the screen and not just interact with buttons and icons, then you can figure it out. Yeah. Like because there's hot spots. Because when you hover over something, you see that it, there's a, there's text that appears on the screen. Again, the fact that this came out in 1989 and there were games on the Amiga well into the 90s that still had not <clears throat> figured out this basic element of game design boggles the mind. I used to play a game. There were games on the PC, they were public domain games, that sort of reminded me of this. My buddies loved them, and I, they would force me to play them. And it were just like this without pictures. Which is mm-hmm. So, in this game, you can play with no pictures. They right. could they So, my my guess is, they were like, hey, better have a, better have some pictures here, otherwise this is just going to look like what it is. A, a long, continuous series of, of menus. Which is, the pictures are don't do anything. They're completely worthless. I mean, you can look at well, them. But they don't do I mean, anything. You can, here's the thing, okay? So this is this is the gameplay loop, okay? You need to get materials, okay? You need to produce uh, energy. Once you're producing enough energy, you can build other things, okay? Eventually, you're going to need to build defenses because you're going to be attacked, and you're going to need to build probes to send <clears throat> your uh, to to explore the galaxy. And then eventually, once you find a habitable planet, you're going to need to send out a portable moon base and a transport ship to transport people out to your new colony. You do this until you win the game. Okay. Yeah. So where does the fun in this game come from? The fun in this game comes from uh, the pictures. It really does. I-, I thought that the pictures in this game looked really evocative i felt like there was there's there's an atmosphere here there's no animation uh there there's very little animation in the pictures um but uh the pictures do i think that they are good um whenever you send a probe out you get a dossier on the planet and uh, you can Eventually. see whether it's habitable or not oh yeah and the, and i forgot there's also a, the whole research aspect so i, I left out a whole step before yeah. you can produce anything you have to research the technology so if this is sounding like a, a ton of other games it is it's like a ton of other games uh it's a lot like a, you know a real time strategy game just without the real time where you know you have to research technologies, then you can build the technologies, but first you need the resources. You're constantly having to manage your energy output, but it's a very simple system. Uh, basically, you have your total output and how much you're drawing. And so you may have to disassemble your mining, or you may have to take your mining offline uh, to get to an, to be able to produce enough energy to produce, you know, the next size battery or whatever, or the next size power source. There are these things called solar gens, and you have there. Are, this game is not very creative when it comes to your your power sources because they're literally named one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, so you're constantly <laughs> yeah. you're constantly upgrading those. Uh, and you you basically you know you send probes out. The probe tells you if the planet is habitable or not. Uh, or you, you've got the whole map of the, the solar system, which includes all of the planets and all of the moons. I think they're all in there. Um, Plus, now, uh, like a few other things, like asteroids are in there. Right, and there's an asteroid field. Okay, so other things that you do in this game. You have to get materials from other places because the moon doesn't have every material that you need. So what you have to do is you have to build a mining ship, and the mining ship is called like the Grazier or something like that. Yeah. Okay. This is another place where the game falls short because I would have liked to have seen a screen that explained what the ships were without yeah. having to yeah. consult the manual. Yeah, they don't have that's one. information that they could have easily put on there uh, in a in a dossier because you have you have a log. You have a, a database, and you, you know in your planet, you, you could have easily had another screen in your database screen that just gave you a rundown of all the ships, basically all the things in the game that, that you can build. That would have been really useful. But anyway, you send your ship out, your mining ship out to the asteroid belt, and every once in a while, uh, you get... Oh, and I forgot to mention the way that time progresses in the game. So you physically advance time in the game. Which is interesting. Um, you uh, you basically you do all that you can do, and whenever you feel like you're done, it's almost like a board game. It's like Civilization. Uh, when you're ready to advance time, you can either advance by the hour or you can advance by the day. Um, one of the design flaws in this game is that there are not enough. Uh, there's not enough times where advancing things by just an hour makes sense. 
Uh, when you go into orbit around a planet, it takes you 45 minutes to land. So that would be a, an opportunity for you to just advance the clock by an hour. But by and large, the action is so slow in this game that you're going to want to advance by the day pretty much all the time. So uh, you basically, you send your mining ship out to the asteroid field, you advance time, you're doing other things, and then every once in a while it'll say your asteroid or your ship is, is scanned an asteroid. You can decide whether you want to put the contents of the asteroid in the hold and bring it back to uh, your moon base, or you can leave it and you can just not do anything, or you can wait for the next one. Now, there's a couple things that are, I think, that are bugs in this game. One is that once your ship picks up the contents of an asteroid, it can't scan any more asteroids. You can leave it out there as long as you want, but it never picks up another scan. Even if you have enough room in your cargo hold, it won't do that. I think that's a mistake. And number two, if you choose to not pick up asteroids three or four times, it'll just stop giving you the choice, uh, which I think is another bug in the programming. Uh, but that's still another cool thing that you can do that kind of gives you some player choice on like it's a push your luck element because there's an element copper is pretty necessary in this game. And you're like, well, this, this one has 30, but I, I've seen an asteroid before that had like 60 or 70. And, you know, you're you're trying to get back and build things because where does the threat in this game come from? Well, the threat comes from the Martians, like you explained before. So the Martians every so often will attack your base. And they do this in a very organized way. Uh, first, one ship will come and attack your base, and then two, and then three, all the way up to ten. So the longer you play, the harder the game gets. Now, to defend your base, you have two options. You can either build orbital lasers, which you do not have the materials for at the beginning of the game, and they are nowhere close to you, or you can build fighters. When you build fighters you uh, in your attack, you scramble a fighter out, and you do battle one-on-one -on -one style first person elite style combat uh, with yeah. the enemy fighter what I did mean, you think about this combat system Aaron? no nah, it wasn't so good uh, i mean it was no, it was not so good it was it was odd it was odd that it was there i'll be honest with you i will say <laughs> i had been stooged off that this had some kind of uh, somebody mentioned in one of their comments that this had some goofy combat in it, and i was like well and so the funny thing is that <clears throat> I've played this game, i played two different sessions of this game, okay? And this game is sort of, it's sort of linear in a weird, in a way, as much as the game as this can be at the beginning anyway. I didn't go, I don't know how far in, I was, I played both of them for a couple of hours. But I mean, stuff sort of happens in the same basic way. And so both times in both games at the beginning, I didn't have enough, I had not built any fighters because I couldn't. Because enough energy, because you sort of have to build your, you sort of have to, at the beginning your resources are limited, and you sort of have to build stuff in a certain order, right? And so I never had any fighters for the, the first attack, and so you realize they come down, like they would kill X amount of your of your colonists, the people in your the people that live there, and then the next time I was like, okay, I'm gonna get these suckers, so I built up some fighters, and then you can launch your fighters and there's an attack, and it goes in this like a first person mode. And there's a the there's an indicator. It's a pretty strange indicator of arrows and a ball. And they'll they'll be up down left and right arrows coming out of the ball, and telling you how far away you are from the ship and what direction to push your ship. That's where you can find the yeah. other ship. It's a very it's a very rudimentary um, radar screen. Yeah, and then you've got lasers. And so basically, you just I mean it it does look just like an elite or something. You just basically find the enemy ship. At least the times mm -hmm. I did it. Uh, and and you shoot the ship. I mean, it's, yeah. it's not and, rocket and you, science. You, you, you only have one it. weapon. Yeah, you only have one weapon. You've got auto fire, so you can basically hold the mouse down. I read somewhere that it takes twenty two hits to bring down a ship. Uh, I was able to bring down the ships more often than not. Yeah, uh, it, it it wasn't too difficult. I never lost. Um, <laughs> when you when you do lose, uh, you lose men or you lose colonists, and if you lose all your colonists, you can no longer function, and the game is over. Yeah. Um, and so that is sort of your impetus to act quickly in this game. Now, you mentioned the linearity of this game. This game is completely linear in terms of the events that happen. So if you take oh, a game like okay. if you take a game like Mule, uh, in Mule, you've got things, and this is a strategy game for the Atari 8-bit and other systems, uh, there are random events that happen that are random. There's pirate attacks, and your mule goes crazy and runs away and things like that. In this game, things always happen 
no matter what. So for example, whenever you build, I believe the fourth generation power source, it, blows. it always blows up the next turn. And yeah. then you have to rebuild everything up from the beginning. I hate whenever that. you send your whenever you send your first probe to the asteroid past the asteroid field, uh, it always explodes in the asteroid field. And then they're like, oh, we need to pilot it better. Yeah. But it's worded in a weird way that almost makes you think you shouldn't send probes past the asteroid field, which it's going to be a real short game if you can't do that, because that's where everything good is. Uh, every time you send a probe to either Mars or one of its moons, it disappears. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, understandably shot down, uh, but it never actually tells you that. They just keep disappearing no matter how many. So things always happen in the same order at the same time whenever certain things happen, but you are still free to you know colonize planets however you see fit. And so what, what this leads to is a game that is beatable, Obviously, you play this game enough times, you always know what planets are habitable and which ones aren't. So you can save your money and save your time and your resources and go right to where you need to go every single time. So you can eventually beat this game fairly easily. Uh, the replay value on a game like this is nil. Once yeah, you beat the game low. and you figure out the secret, you do get a percentage completion at the end. But I don't know that the end, the, the ending itself isn't so spectacular that you're going to want to see it again. Did you actually um, get to the end of uh, playing this? I didn't play that long to get that. I part. didn't. I didn't see the end. I just. I. I. People were disappointed by the ending of this game. Well, you know, um, you you yeah, clearly you enjoyed this more than I did. Now I'm not going to sit did. here. I enjoyed I'm this game. I'm not going to kill it. Okay, because a lot of what you said I agree with. Once you get used to the. The interface, it's a good interface, but I mean, they, it could have been better, but it's not. But it, we've seen much, much worse. Now, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not a, I'm not a strategy gamer. Okay, so I would say this is right in my wheelhouse in terms of what you have to manage, uh, and without being making it crazy. This is not the worst game to like begin your strategy career in. You know, something like this. It's not that. It's not super difficult. It's something else about it. It's not super stressful, and it's not it's like you're screwed. Like right. it's like <laughs> one thing I learned early on is that don't be afraid to like advance the calendar for as long as you want. I mean, it's very. I mean, <laughs> nothing. The enemy really... attacks. The enemy attacks are very, very yeah. sporadic, and yeah. I'm sure that once you colonize more planets, it's programmed into the game that the enemy attacks will come more fast and furious. Yeah, but you're right. Like, it will, here's the thing. This game is accurate in turn. Well, it's it tries to be accurate in terms of distance, and so yeah. like it's going to take you months and months and months, or maybe even years, to get to certain places in the solar system. And so the game is set up for you to set a probe, let it go off into space, and then you're going to be doing a bunch of other stuff while you're waiting for that probe to land wherever it's going. Um, the thing about it, but I like that and. To me, even though the game is only something that you can really beat once, the fact that there is an ending and the fact that you can depend on certain things happening, the fact that you can see the light at the tunnel, even though I didn't come anywhere close to beating it, I read a review from somebody that said it took five years of in-game time for him to beat it, and that was doing everything right. So you know how long it takes for you to advance the clock. I mean, it it probably takes you, you know, anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute just to advance one month, you know, if you do nothing but hold down the button. Yeah. And so even when you've got the solution completely figured out, it's going to take you a long time to fully beat this game. Now, what would have been great, what I would have done to make this game better, aside from all of the UI things that we talked about earlier, is I would have just made two modes. I would have made a mode that had like story mode, and then I would have had just a, another mode where the the planets were you know habitable or inhabitable, random. You know, you just make a random seed, and then you go from there. It's it's sort of weird, and I really would like to talk to the coder to ask him why that was that would that would be more difficult than making such a linear game in the first place because he must have known that once you figure out like once uh and i can't remember the name of the moon but one of jupiter's moons i think is the first place where you can actually land and it's a habitable planet um why you couldn't just make it random every time you started the game and that way you could play this game literally yeah. forever yeah yeah i uh and something else you know the uh, the martian colony as far as i can tell uh, I, I, they would attack occasionally, and I believe you could get to the point where you could go attack them. I never did, 
But, I mean, I don't think they were actually doing it. I never saw them, like, in deep space or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, I don't think that they do anything but attack yeah. you. And that, and, the, the, the AI is, right. is definitely, yeah, it's definitely a, a weak point in the game as well. I agree. I'll be honest with you. I got to a point in this game. I built all my uh, powers. Like you mentioned, not every mineral is available on, on the moon. For example, mm -hmm. uranium comes to mind if you want to build the right. orbital laser, okay? Right. Which is great for product protecting the moon, obviously. you got an orbital laser. Uh, and it's something you can, you can research all this stuff, but you can't build it. Okay, there's several things you can't build. So what that means is you have to go off planet and to, to with probes to try to find these resources. So you are, you learn early on to just make a crap load of probes and just send them mm -hmm. everywhere. It's a, that's something mm -hmm. I did in both, you know, with the second game, really. I really hammered it. But you get to the point where you're basically just waiting for probes to get places and so you're just going forward. I mean, and there's nothing else really you can do. You I mean, you can keep building power and stuff. You can sort of prep for later, you know, for mm -hmm. when you colonize. And then you've got it like by the first game in particular, where I didn't know where everything was. Like I kept failing to get at anything with my probes. You know, like you said, you send a bunch to Mars, they disappear, and it's frustrating when you go send these things, and then you wait forever. It seems like it takes forever to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know it's real time, but it's just it takes forever. And then once you get there, the probe disappears, or you land in a place that doesn't have anything. You're just like, oh, God, I got here we go again. Let's send out another yeah. batch of these suckers. And so that got kind of old. The combat, like I said, it was infrequent, and it wasn't, I would not call it heinous, but I'd call it pointless, you know, and, and really uh, across the board, not just because it's of the mode you play, it's because it just, and it's not a huge deal. Or maybe the attacks get worse. But they don't, and like you said, they don't attack all that often. And once I figured out in the second game that it was just like the first game, that did help the second game. Don't get me wrong, but mm -hmm. I mean, again, it, it, without any the random chance element, it makes it a little lamer, you know. Yeah. Once I figured out, hey, I should send guys to go mine the asteroids. I didn't, I didn't think about that in the first game. You know, I, I learned something, and that I could use that going forward. But once you ultimately get to the end of this by learning all this stuff. You know it. And so when you go back to play it, it's not going to be as much fun. What would have been... We had games for the PC. I remember this game called P, uh, VGA Planets. And there were other games, even stuff like Master of Orion that came after this, that sort of went down this road. This game, I think, would have been more fun with a multiplayer element. I know that's... I know what year it is. I know what computer it's on. But I could see where you could put a multiplayer element in this and make it a lot of fun. Or even a turn-based one, you know? Sort of like mm -hmm. Civilization. I would mm -hmm. like to have, like, diplomacy stuff. Maybe you could make hook up. Do we have to always fight the Martians? Do we have to always fight? Can we maybe we could find some different a, a little more stuff? Believe it or not, I'm asking for more stuff in this game as opposed to less stuff. Well, because, yeah, it's 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 definitely it's almost it's, it's, sparse. I guess is what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, it's it's a it's a thin line to to trod when you're uh, when you're asking for more features, but at the same time, more features can be more confusing and more intimidating. So yeah. Uh, I feel like this guy, you know, he had an idea. He executed his idea well. Was it a perfect idea? No. And he probably improved. And by improved, I mean made more featureful and complex with this second game. Yeah, and I've heard it's good. Now, I will say this. And, again, I'm not burying this game. Because, like I said, this game, for a, for somewhat of my skill level, was right in my wheelhouse. Because you mm -hmm. guys all know me. You know, I didn't need the six-page manual except for a couple times. I figured it out. I mean, eventually, I, once you play it and sit down with it for a couple of hours, you can get the gist of it. But for a lot of listeners that are very advanced in this area, this may be a little bit too uh, easy or too or not as fulfilling as a lot of game, other games of this genre would be. It may be below your abilities, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, this is one of these games that you can look back at and you can say this is really you know where uh, so many games sprang forth from. Because 89, I mean, it is very early on to have a game yeah. in this genre. And you can see how other games built upon it. I will say for me, I'm a big art guy. And the art in this game goes a long way to making me happy. Um, uh, I think that if this game, I mean, you're dead on that this game could absolutely survive with no art whatsoever. And yeah. you could probably play it like a BBS door game or something yeah. like that. It, um, yeah, it but, reminds me, this is like, an, it, it, it's like, uh, if you took the graphics out of this, you would have a very good public domain game. That's what yeah. you would have. 
with yeah, the graphics yeah. and the extra work. And by the way, the sound effects I didn't like either because just, no, I, they, they got old. Like especially they were the defense so one, that was the worst one. Yeah, this is know? another classic example of your Amiga game that has a, a nice tune at the beginning, and then as soon as you start playing, well, I hope you enjoyed it because you'll never hear it again. Yeah, yeah and, and they, every menu you go on, there has its own like special effect. For example, the one I did like was in the power area. When you would upgrade, it would you could hear that noise of the power mm -hmm. going, the getting more power. That right, was cool. That was cool. But then you got that whale sound that the defense area made. Roo, roo. <laughs> no good. You don't need a. Yeah. You don't need an annoying sound in every menu. I I turned the sound off. Oh, uh, pretty pretty quickly. It was brutal quickly. in a couple places. Yeah. Uh, and and there are some elements. This like the 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 map where the space map where you can map in and out, or even when you advance the days and you see the the universe spinning around the plants i mean there's some advanced behind the scenes work here that I, I, they probably could have taken a little more advantage of than they did from you honest. know th there there are a couple things that i think were wasted opportunities one is that you you do not need to ever zoom out uh whenever no. <laughs> you advance the calendar it automatically zooms you out but like there's a screen where you can see the satellites um uh orbiting a planet uh, you know, your ships or whatever, but there's no reason to ever look at that screen. It's yeah. totally useless. I didn't know it was there until I was wa getting, I was watching a playthrough, getting some tips, and I saw the guy go there because I never went to it. You don't need to go there, mm -hmm. like you said. Right. But it's just kind of neat. It's like you get to see the planet from like the, the, the four, you know, the 10, four, the, you know, the big viewing area of the ship mm -hmm. that you sent there, you know. Right. But yeah, I mean, a perfectly playable game. It plays fine. Uh, it's, it run fine if you, Need something, just a, a light game. Maybe if you've got a son or a daughter that's coming up, you want to get them their feet wet, this would probably wouldn't be the worst way to go. I mean, it's, yeah. I'd, I'd say this is a lot easier than, say, like Civilization or something. This game reminds me so much of if Mule was not a multiplayer game, if it was a single-player game. It's sort of like the trading economics equivalent of like a 4X game, of like a very, very early example. But what saves Mule is that it is a multiplayer game. And if this game had that turn-based multiplayer component, it would have been, you know, really, really good. I think this is a lot easier than Mule, personally. <laughs> That's just me, uh, Boaster. Um, you know, I'll, just for fun, I uh, had a look. You know, we mentioned that this came out on... Uh, the ST and DOS. Uh, I went ahead and pulled up the DOS, the ST version, I should say, just for comparison. Yeah, mm -hmm. guess what? They're eerily similar, as you can tell if you're watching <laughs> at home. You, I would I would love to see you pick out one from the other. The, neither one mm -hmm. of these things are what I would call, like, graphical juggernauts. I mean, they they right. do the job they're supposed to do, but there's nothing uh, super incredible about what's going on. And uh, you can see that, in comparison, they're very, very similar. Uh, in every mm -hmm. way. So there's not a whole lot to talk about there, Boat. Um, I'll look this up uh, to see how it, how it fared in the reviews of the day, Boatster. It's funny, a lot of people uh, love this game. The Lemon gave this thing an 8.31, a very high, higher score than I would have anticipated. Uh, back in the day, Amiga Computing gave this a 72%. Man, AUI Amiga... <laughs> They didn't get it, Boat. They gave this a 40%. They dropped the hammer Ouch. on this thing. Four out of ten. C, uh, Commodore User Amiga gave this an 84%. Uh, Dator Magazine gave this a 8 out of 10. And the average came out to 78% uh, on this one, Boat. So did you get any Discord action, my friend? We did. We did. We'll start things off with David Hearn Ryder. He says... Millennium 2.2 was a nice-looking, single-load, space-age, resource management and strategy game that was enjoyable to play through. You could beat the game in half a day and have fun doing it. The icons were intuitive, though there were some tedious features like advancing time. Yeah. I preferred it to Detrius, Dutrius, I wish I knew how to say that, the sequel, though that end screen was a letdown. I give it 8 out of 10 mineable asteroids. <laughs> Dave Velociraptor says he's only played the ST version, but it's a fantastic 4X strategy game. I like the adventure touches in it. Following on the in the legacy and feeling of Elite as well as Reach for the Stars, this is very much my kind of game. Love the music, too. Years later came Master of Orion, which made the genre famous, and now there's things like Stellaris, Sins of a Solar Empire, and many others. This was my first real exposure to the genre. It's still playable now because it has a reasonable UI and isn't too complicated. 9 out of 10. Lord Soup! Writes, it's a game about managing mining and haulage, but somehow makes some poor schmucks probably underpaid job entertaining. <laughs> it's a blast. 
My only criticism is that the fighter defense minigame gets so slow. Otherwise, a game that definitely needs a remaster. A cool feature would also be randomizing the solar system, so if, like me, space stuff is your fodder and you don't have an idea where to go. One of my favorite games of its era. 9 out of 10. Wow. Lobsterminator writes, This is the type of game I prefer to play on the Amiga these days. My favorite games are ones I can have running on my Amiga and play throughout the day while I do other things. Yes. I enjoyed this back in the day, and I still enjoy it. As mentioned in previous review, the replay value is lower due to not enough randomization, but it's still good fun if you play it rarely enough that you don't remember everything. Like many Amiga games, a bit of extra work would have made this a timeless classic 8 out of 10. And finally, Vinny Cake says, This is a game I have a real fondness for. It teaches you two things, patience and the vast size of our solar system. It's rare to find a strategy game that's relatively straightforward to pick up and play without wading through a vast manual. I did find it fairly easy to get to the end, but that's no bad thing. Fighter minigame feels a little half-baked and impossible to lose, and the game would benefit from randomizing resources across the habitable planets and moons, as I believe the DOS version did. That's interesting. Overall, this is one I come back to every couple years and rec would recommend to anyone 9 out of 10. Those scores were... <clears throat> Higher than I would have anticipated. Not me, man. This is a solid nine out of ten game for me. This this might be the best game we played all year. You're, on you guys. I, uh, really? Yeah, I love this game. I don't. I don't see that. I, I mean, I think this is a. I mean, a, maybe a, a little above average. That's the best as I go. Uh, I looked this up on eBay. Now, clearly, the people buying this game ha are closer to what you guys think than I am. I could not find any of these having sold recently. However, there were some for sale. All right, and these are buy it now prices, okay? All in the UK. All right, so someone selling a complete box version of this. These are the big boxes, one thirty eight. That's US dollars. All right. Then another guy was like, "Oh yeah, I'll sell mine for one hundred twenty four. I saw one hundred and fifty two, and some real lucky gentleman's trying to get one hundred ninety seven. These are all complete boxes, so they're out there, and these were all buy it now prices. So if you're real hard up for this one i mean real hard up get out the checkbook because those are some yeah. those are lofty prices boat so i'm this tells Look, me i mean this is this is one of the classic games in my opinion this is one of the classic games for the system i cannot believe that this doesn't that people aren't talking about this and people are still talking about freaking shadow of the beast is one of the greatest games well, of the Amiga. i mean first of all i'm surprised it, for a game that's so ballyhooed, apparently we I'd never heard of it, not at one time, and I, I, I'm guessing you hadn't either. No, uh, never. And so, never. so I don't know. Maybe it's just there's a certain group of people that really, really dig it. It's not crap. So. Don't get me wrong, but some people like it more than others. There you go. Bro. True, true. All right, Aaron. Let's leave Millennium 2.2 and go on to what's been going on over on our uh, YouTube channel. All right, let's have a look, Boaster. So. This was a, a, not a super busy week, but we'll touch on a few of these things. Uh, let's start off with myself and the Brent. You know, the Brent, he's always here. And this week, uh, we did pretty good on this one, Boat. This was modern 16-bit games. These mm -hmm. are games that would have that came out recently and for older systems. Uh, boy, we I don't want to say we got into a, into a slight uh, uh, misunderstanding this week, but we did have a bit of a tiff on the show. <laughs> As we screamed loudly back and forth uh, and had a huge fight. Uh, the game I selected, Demons of Asterberg, which is a brand new, I mean brand new, like came out in August game for the Sega Mega Drive boat or, or uh, Genesis if you're in the U.S. This is a, I think they call these a Metroidvania style uh, game where you run around and my favorite part of this game is the fact that the whole basis of it is a, a, an agreement between demons and humans that went awry. <laughs> and I can't imagine. You could have imagined the demons would have reneged on the deal. When I read the backstory for this, I did. I cackled out loud at the stupidity of the humans. Uh, anyway, this is a, the largest Genesis game ever made, allegedly, uh, boat. And so I bought this, uh, played it, and Brent played it. We both really liked it. Uh, then the Brent. Uh, not to be outdone, went and got himself a game uh, called Lethal Wedding. Now, Lethal Wedding is free uh, from Mad Cats Studios, and I think mm -hmm. the price is right because I didn't think this game was any good at all, but Brent put it over like it was the Citizen Kane of Genesis games. It was like talking about how great it was. And then when I when I disputed the greatness of the game, it was a it was a bally, a ballyhoo, a tussle. It, it went down, uh, Boat. So, 
you like to hear me and Brent yell, and apparently a lot of people do, then this is the this is the show for you. Uh, we got into <laughs> quite a struggle, but I will say, sixteen uh, bit modern games. Remember how we used to badmouth the Amiga? It's like where's all the games? Well, now there's zillions of them, and we're and the yeah. Amiga is looking real good. Uh, mm-hmm. amongst these other games because i actually had trouble finding one and i wanted to pick one that wasn't for the amiga so there you go two modern genesis titles or mega drive titles for your uh perusal uh here we go boaster you were up involved in this this is photon for the coco yeah. 3 talk about it boat so speaking of w- one of my favorite games ever for a system this one might take the cake in terms of the coco 3 um, this game is a kind of puzzly push and pull the block, avoid the blob game where you're trying to reach an exit. It's like if Sokoban got some attitude. <laughs> and uh, and I really, really enjoyed this game. It's got the music, it's got it's got audio tracks that 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 are unheard of on the Coco. Yeah. I mean, it's like real songs in this game. This thing's batting um, outside of its uh, usual average for the I mean, this thing yeah. is I, I never has a game been so perplexing to me until I figured out what was going on and then so enjoyable as this game. <laughs> when yeah. you look at it, you're like, what in God's name am I looking at? And then eventually you figure yeah, this it out. Is, this may be the, the the latest game that we ever review on the Coco in, in terms of commercial releases. This came out in 91, which is pretty late in the lifespan. Yeah. So um, this is this is definitely one. Photon uh, for the Coco 3 exclusively. Check out our review, and if you like it, you know, fire up BCC, or if you've got, if you're lucky enough and rich enough these days to have a Coco 3, uh, fire it up on there. You will not be disappointed. Did I tell you I came across a Coco 2, 3? Did I mention that on the show last week uh, during my travel? You have not mentioned it. Mention you know, it. I had last Friday off before the show. Mm-hmm. Me and the boy went out to Starship Games in Cross Lanes, and they had a Coco 2 there for sale. But it was a, it was a Coco two with a Coco three keyboard, Wacky. and all the books and cartridges with it were Coco three, and so I was like, "What is this?" And I still don't know because believe it or not, <laughs> with all the crap in that store, he didn't have any RF mods. It didn't have an RF switch to try it out. So there you go. So it definitely wasn't like the guts of a Coco three and a no, Coco two. No, I talked to Kurt. Uh, uh, L. Curtis Boyle told me that that was, a, that was no way that was going to happen. Okay. We don't know. It's some sort of anomaly, boat. Who knows, yeah. buddy? Who knows? But it was something wacky. Uh, here we go. Speaking of something wacky, something wacky this way come. It's that crazy old Flack, Jack Flack. And this time around, he did it up the way I like to do it, which is sitting around for an hour playing a bunch of Donkey Kong game. <laughs> I don't have a problem with that, buddy. He jumped right out of the Commodore 64 and loaded up some DK uh, mm-hmm. And played a ton of DK before he moved on to what what comes natural after playing DK. Now, Aaron, I know that you're you're I mean one of the one of the greatest ever when it comes to Donkey Kong. How That's do you true. rate Flack's uh, ability at Donkey Kong? Flack plays this like a point pusher does. Mm. Like, I don't. I never. You know me. I never play like that. I literally just play to go through levels, mm-hmm. and so I never score. I mean, I sometimes score quite well, but I'm not. A, I never point push because I get bored doing that mm-hmm. i don't like that but flack went to work now and then flack played some junior but when he when the main event came around this is one of your old favorites boaster mm-hmm. uh, the old mario brothers flack went to work brother posting a mammoth score on here let's see if we can get to the score he ended up with it was a mighty mighty score here like 167,000, something like 153,000. 153,000. That's up. Yeah. Now, me and you, we'll, we can tangle up in the 150K zone now and again, but it was still cool. To now do that again. while streaming, I was very impressed, Boat. Uh, yeah. Plus, listen, when you tune into a Flack gig, there's not just some geek playing games. This is a, this is a wizard of conversation he gets in there and you get the full entertainment package man he's like liza minnelli or sammy davis jr he's singing mm-hmm. he's dancing he's playing he's talking about food it's a big huge event i highly for the sandwiches that's right buddy well i don't I, i'm not gonna comment on that <laughs> but yeah it was good it was good entertaining stuff and since while we're at it boat because <clears throat> we've only got two weeks left uh, before the deal goes down Last week, speaking of Jack Flack, he joined me last week on Conversations from the Dark Side, but you were mm-hmm. on assignment, and mm-hmm. Flack stepped up, and I have to say, I really, really enjoyed this one, Boatster. Uh, it was Dreams and Nightmares. We had a good slate of callers, 
all kinds of crazy dreams and nightmares. Uh, we learned a lot. We had some laughs. Had a lot of fun. And this week's offering will be uh, uh, tonight at 8.30, Boat. Uh, for those that choose to join us, I believe the topic, yes, messages from beyond the grave, Boat. Ooh. This is going to be a, a spine tingler dingler. Uh, this will be the second to last uh, Tales of the Dark Side of October, and then next week we'll have our big Halloween episode where we have ghost stories. It'll be where we'll be doing ghost stories, personal ghost stories, ghost encounters, and all that stuff. But this mm -hmm. week, communication from beyond the grave, Boat. It should be a it's good. It's going to be great. I can't so wait. If you are around at eight thirty tonight, as we film this, which is uh, October twenty second. That'll be 8.30 Eastern Standard Time. Pop in, won't you, and join us uh, for Conversations from the Dark Side Boat. That's all we've got this week. Did you guys do anything on This Week in Retro, Boatster? We did. We did do a little bit this uh, this past week. Uh, this past week, Aaron, we released a show that actually has done really well uh, compared to uh, lots of our shows. Um, <laughs> when, I think it's all, uh, <laughs> it's all down to the... Uh, the mega 65 you know the mega 60 do you know much about the mega 65 aaron i i know just enough to to be dangerous bode uh with the well, mega that's, 65. that is that's the final story of the show we uh we talked about how the mega 65 is this it's this computer aaron 666 that, pounds yeah or that euros is, something that is huge yeah that's the it's, big a, it's a very expensive fpga uh Commodore 64 with a built-in floppy drive. Uh, this thing is definitely uh, an enthusiast project. Uh, there and don't get me wrong, they they I think they made 400 of these and they sold out all 400. Yeah. Now, when you've got a user base the size of the Commodore 64s, uh, then you know you could probably you can probably find 400 people that are willing to pay almost anything for something that will allow them to explore an alternative timeline where Commodore released the ultimate system. Um, and I'm not saying that this thing is, is crap. I'm just saying it is a big chunk of change, man. A big chunk of change. You know, here, here I've got two things. Seven. Number one, people that bought this probably grew up with a C64, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in my mind, studies have shown, because I've no real studies to back this up, that if you were a kid that grew up with a computer, you're already ahead of the curve, and you're probably making that sweet, sweet money because you were True. a brainchild, right? Because... No idiots allowed in the home computer market. You had to have a lot mm -hmm. of jack, all right? Yeah. So you got Commodore users. They got a bunch of WAD, and they're like, holy crap, mystery computer from beyond the moon? I'm in. And they buy it. Now, <laughs> this is a lot like the uh, the ZX Next, except I believe this actually started. Uh, they were working on this before the ZX Next even was born. This thing's mm -hmm. been around forever. And so they've got it done. Good on them. Uh, and they're selling this thing for the big money. Now, clearly, you know the old saying, but if you could sell out of what you got, you charge too little. You know, they could have mm -hmm. charged maybe 800 uh, bucks. Right. Uh, and I'm sure these will go big money on eBay. So I'm be selling out. I don't know what this thing does. When I heard it was FPGA, though, I was happy because much. I'm hoping it's going to be like the ZX Next. And for people like myself who just happen to have the Mister sitting around, maybe they'll have a. Uh, Mega 65 core, and I'll just get the mm -hmm. re the benefits of all this stuff without actually paying six hundred dollars. The right, price on this, right. by the way, six hundred and sixty six dollars. What is that all about? <laughs> well, that's all that's you know, that's a nod to the Apple One. The Apple One was released at six hundred sixty six dollars and sixty six cents. That confirms a lot to me because I, <laughs> I, I think we all know that there was a deal with the devil was made uh, for <laughs> Apple to get this much jack. But yeah, if you, if this is your bag, hey, you know. Spend it, man. I've spent yeah. a lot of money on dumber crap in my life. So, yeah. And maybe this is going to be awesome. I don't know. But I've not seen anything for it. I've not seen any software. I don't know what kind of commuter they got. I don't know nothing. Mm -hmm. We also talk about a finger-length sized Atari 2600, Aaron. This has got to be the smallest console that I've ever seen. It's the mini RF modulator, the first story of the, the uh, show. This thing is so tiny, Aaron, that uh, it, it comes with its own TV set. And uh, it is a um, it is a thing to behold. This is definitely not something that you're going to want to play for very long without inducing eye strain. It doesn't look like we got any video of that. Oh, there it is on there. Uh, have you seen any? This is by a company called Super Impulse. I watched and uh, I watched this on your show. Okay, so I, mm -hmm. I am up to speed when it comes to this week in retro. And I can tell you, I think that, first of all, when you said this, when the, the title threw me because it was like 
RF, uh, uh, mini RF modulator. I thought to myself, man, someone has made an RF modulator for these old machines to make it real easy to hook them up to HDMI or something. That would be cool. That's not what it is. No. Someone, and by the way, the, the kid playing uh, Dance Dance Revolution with his hand, that's the geekiest kid I've ever seen right there. Take a look. I don't know whose hand that is, but that's a geek, brother. I think this is the stupidest. No, it's amongst the stupidest things I've ever seen. Now, I know, uh, here we go with this whole thing. You're going to put the stuff on your shelf or whatever. But now the shelf crap's getting so small you can't even see it. You know? What are we doing? And the fact that this has a usable joystick, it doesn't make a lick of sense. It's go- What the hell was this? I don't even want this. And it was, wasn't it super pricey or something? No, the, the 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 one good thing I don't know. There even might be multiple good things about this. It's only thirty five bucks, so it's not going to break the bank. You especially can buy coming a real Atari for that. But yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Sakes. But anyway, we talk about this is you know this, this last week we really let it all hang that, out. We yeah we went long. We went real long on uh, on on this week in retro, and uh, people yeah, responded did. well. So if you want to listen to me and Neil kick back. Talk about being freaks and weirdos back in middle school. You can hear about the Star Trek convention I attended. Uh, all of the things that, that that make you happy. Um, check out this week in retro. We got a new episode coming out tomorrow morning. Yeah, it was great. It was a great one this week. But I'd say I was mildly amused by your wacky stories. But the Dance Dance <laughs> Revolution kid, that one really. I, 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 <laughs> I can't. I can't fight you on that. that I was sitting at a rest stop. Hand. I was taking. I was at a rest stop. I was on a job, and I looked at them like. What? I laughed out loud, uproariously. I bet the people around me thought I was on crack. I was laughing. I was like, what is this? Bizarre, but very good, yeah. though. I enjoyed it, man. All right, and just a quick update on our community score challenges. Uh, we are still running, of course, the Rough and Tumble uh, high score competition on the Amigos Discord. And uh, this is the final day to get your score in for Mikey for the ZX Spectrum because we are taping mikey uh on our sinclair this sunday in two oh, two short days uh speaking of that uh if you've got a, a sunday afternoon where you're living free and easy and you want some uh, retro computing uh shows to listen to we are recording uh our sinclair our show about the zx spectrum uh 1200 xl all about the atari 8-bit and the coco show of course all about the tandy color computer we're doing those back to back to back starting at 3 p.m uh, this Sunday, and who knows if we're feeling froggy, we might tack on and ask the amigos after the at the end of all that. So crazy, you can hang out with me and Aaron all afternoon. You know, and just in case, Bode, that uh, there's two more little uh, things I want to announce real quick. Uh, just in case you haven't gotten enough <laughs> of us, <laughs> uh, it, uh, by 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 popular demand, uh, we have tentatively scheduled the next uh, International Computer Club. I'm telling everyone this now. So you can you can file your grievances or applaud or mark your calendars, but uh, we're going to do another one of these things, Boat, and we're and by popular popular demand, we're going to start much earlier. We're going to tentatively plan this thing for 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on January 29th, 2022. Okay, so 2022. This is not a Super Bowl weekend. There's no football on this day if you're an American. There's nothing going on, boat. There won't be any baseball. It'll just that's How's why I reserve no that weekend. Is huh? that the week? Before the I already Super Bowl? checked. There's nothing. There's no. There's that's no. Crazy. They're having the playoff games the day before. It's all part of my oh, or the day yeah. after. It'll be it's a one Saturday. Of those deals, yeah. So if you are interested, uh, boat will be putting up the sign up sheet probably in the next month or so, and then you can probably the next couple of days. We'll and we'll mm-hmm. we'll let you start signing up. Uh, now, starting at 4 o'clock does not necessarily mean we want to run six hours instead of four, for example. <laughs> but uh, sign up now. Get in there. Uh, the last International Computer Club was top shelf. I've liked them all, frankly, Bo. Mm-hmm. They've all been good. And uh, there's always an entertaining uh, gimmick. One more quick item before we move along. Uh, you guys may know that I, and sometimes Bo, are members of uh, an outfit called the Team Speak Irregulars. The Team oh, Speaker yeah. Regulars on uh, a, a week from tomorrow, that'll be October 30th, will be having their Team Speaker Regulars Halloween Spooktacular boat. It's going to be uh, all horror games all evening long, and everyone will be wearing costumes that night. So oh, they're, they're very excited. I was not about aware this of boat. that. Yeah, this is just, I'm just, I'm Even now the Chud? releasing it. This is everybody. It's going to wow. be a happening. Uh, if you aren't familiar with it, the Team Speaker Regulars. 
have their own chitch, uh, Twitch channel. It's called The Team Speak Irregulars. It's on Twitch. If you type in The Team Speak Irregulars, all one word, you'll come to it. Subscribe, follow, whatever you do. And we they broadcast every Saturday from 7.30 to God knows when, usually past midnight, with a whole variety of retro and modern games, mostly modern. Uh, but this will be their Halloween Spooktacular. That'll be next Saturday. So tune in, won't you? There you go, Excellent. Bo. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Aaron, it's time to talk about last week's Patreon song challenge. Horrible. Uh, one for the record books. Um, of course, it was uh, Never Gonna Give You Up by Rick Astley. You lied. What happened to the nine, the choruses, and all that stuff? Nothing. Yeah. And uh, I want to congratulate Rob O'Hara for being first with the wrong answer and first with the right answer. <laughs> What was the wrong answer, <laughs> if I may ask? Bohemian Rhapsody. What? How yeah. did you get that? Well, I set it up. What else has nine choruses in uh, the original members of Queen? I, I promised Freddie Mercury was going to do a guest spot. Listen, no one was buying that. Good <laughs> Lord. So congratulations to Flack, Super Tech Boy, Heavy Systems Inc., Jugglebox, Alien Breeder, Gary Heather, and Andy Craig. I'm sure many, many more guessed that one uh and uh yeah that was a that was and, and again hats off to Lobsterminator for programming in that mod you know in order to get that to sync up correctly with the track that i was singing along with he had to actually go in and like make micro adjustments to the mods timing and do all kinds of wacky stuff to get he's a he's a wizard he's a wizard with the tracker yeah. never has someone struggled so mightily to provide something to someone that was going to so brutally destroy it <laughs> <laughs> That's true. True words have never been spoken. So, Aaron, that brings us to this week's Patreon song challenge. If you know this week's song, please shoot me an email at john at amigospodcast.com. I will announce you as a winner on next week's show. If you are live in the chat, please do not reveal the answer in the chat. Instead, just email me. Aaron, are you ready? I haven't even heard this one, Bo. This came in at the 11th hour, so it I don't did. have any idea what this is going to be. Are you ready? Let's Here do it. we go. Mr. Chip, Peter Price, Herman B. Wonder, the Chess and Mark Richards, and David Turner. Chris Edwards, Ram, okay, Ram, okay, David Terrace, Drew Carlos, Matthew Gobia. Sith Yates, Alistair B, Christian Russell, David Z, George Rosansky, The Amiga Show, Daniel Crabtree, Super Bammy King, Crazy Loomis, William Vinter, Scar, Heavy Systems, Bending Frag, Lord Mark Byron, Olaf Holprinsky, Jonah, aka Simulant, Alien Breed, Dave Velociraptor, Calvert Boy, Link Vincent, Daniel Williams, Luke Hudson, John Cook, Bomb the Base, Frodo in El Sol, Incisive Tech Mage, Jurgen Mr. Colda, Bernard Lucas, Jerry Dimington, Zorba Brief, Fletch, and Simon Ledge, Captain Crispy, Kilobytes, and Cap. Every head of free lunch with the cake box. David Pickford Cameron, Armstrong Andy Jones, Lobster Minator, 10 Minute Amiga Retro Pass, Bernard Quinn, RMC Tim Drew. Joseph Harrison Calder, Rob O'Hara, Matthew Lermore, and the Craig Sons of Art, the Roy, the Grand Ramon, to the Zombies. Kevin Alakibar, Chico Tillemelor, John Marshall, Matthew Perron, Ricky the Roche, the Dead Boy, Piggy City, Zeta Slow North, Steph on Shore, Mortensen, and then Helen. Christopher, I saw Ravi Abbey, Chris Wolf, Laura Drew, Grand Vicky, Adam Bass, Bio Bronze, Richard Vintage, Gary Hunter, Paul Harrington, Duncan Styles, Cash from the Crypt, Josh Mann, 
Adam Bradley, Jody Stewart, Keith Shee, Eric Nelson, John Tony Homestay, Daniel Pixon, Drew, Larry Kruger, and Aaron Cruz, Jason Moore, Jason Dunn, and Kill All right, so <laughs> I want to give a special shout out to Bruno Langer, uh, Marie, the foreign exchange student that was staying with us for a while. That is her father who contributed uh, all the guitar parts to that number. No of kidding. Of course, yeah, all the way from France. The big F, as you say. And uh, you say it one time. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we've got reflection on bass. And the one, the only, Graham Vebke, brought to you by Red Symbols. Very good. Hey, you know, I almost forgot. We forgot something in the news I want to touch on real quick. You know, this past weekend, boat Amy West uh, went down. Yeah. And I did catch a little bit of the of the live presentation there, including uh, uh, I saw a couple Amigos t-shirts floating around. Really? Uh, including the MC was wearing one. And uh, I, that's I'm always down. That's awesome. Uh, this looked like yeah. quite a show. They had it looks like they had a pretty good turnout uh, boat. Uh, there was a lot of uh, technical. Uh, uh, there was a lot of technically based speeches and whatnot. That you know, there we're doing games for a reason. We too dumb to. <laughs> I don't know anything about some of that stuff. But uh, congratulations on from by all accounts was a uh, a few. Uh, uh, a few shout outs. Thank you, Tim Mark. Tim Mark says there were a few shout outs for us, but uh, congratulations on what looked to be a total success, Boat. And uh, hopefully, next year, once the unpleasantness has passed, Amy West will continue to grow and be another major success. So well done, boys. Absolutely. Congratulations, guys. Uh, and of course, congratulations to all of our Twitch subscribers. Thank you so much for uh, supporting our channel through Twitch. We hope you enjoy watching us live. Including Luminate 08, Picard 2010, Low Jellyfish, Back to 8 Bit with Hermski, Gary Heather, Mitsuyama, Great Owl G, Bite Links, Ami Steph, Proto NL, EO4077, Barkbit, Real Retro Dude, Wing Chun Wolf, Brock 101, Jedi Mon, Da Crabs MTG, Lip Blop, Pixels at Dawn Gaming, Buck Owens, Super Fama King, Jigglebox, Retro Jerry, Thurso Board, Twilight Zoner, Super Tech Boy, John Marshall 3, Paco Take, Still Adolescing, Monza Mess, Macintosh Librarian, Neg Sol, Metaberg, Air Jury, Scumboy, Benz 666, Texas Foosballer, Captain Chaos DK, Mr. Toast 6502, Jay Borchers, Edvin Helland, and Orom. Thank you guys so much for supporting us through Twitch. Thank you. All right, Aaron, next week on Amigos, it's our ever popular. People are just banging down the doors for another one of these. It's the Spooktacular, the sixth oh, annual no. Amigos oh, Spooktacular. Oh, no. <laughs> these are always death, vote. Oh, God. So we've got two, two big titles, Aaron, to talk about next week. We've got Horror Zombies from the Crypt which was suggested by Amigos Game Selection Committee member Brutal Barracuda, and PD Game Bloodfest, which was suggested by The Dunk, Duncan Styles. Well, oh man, okay. Well, we'll play them. Has, <laughs> we've never had a successful spooktacular, not one. And particularly Maybe the six ones where is you were our wearing magic that, number. When you were wearing that green outfit, those were particularly <laughs> unsuccessful. <laughs> I've never been so happy to be over here. If you wear it next year, I'm going to be far away from that. You weren't invisible to me, Boat. That's oh. true. I wasn't. I think it was skin tight. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll see you next week. Until then, adios. adios.